Hi, this is Ushio, and welcome back to Say Rules Grimoire. In the last episode, we kinda almost killed a bunch of people, but we got away with it, and now people sort of respect us. Or maybe they fear us, I'm not actually sure. We're gonna find out, we're back to class on our second day of school. The classroom slowly fills with students as the start of our lesson draws near. Most of my classmates glance around the room as they enter. They scan the classroom from my face, and upon making eye contact, most of them wave or smile. Just like the initial batch of students, None of them show me any malice. They aren't willing to walk over to my desk and talk to me, but their curiosity is evident nonetheless, and not one of them shows a sour expression. Is this what it's like to be popular? Everybody knows who I am, even though I barely know any of them. They all recognise me and smile at me, yet they don't know the first thing about me. It's a bit unsettling to be stared at and talked about, but I can't say I dislike it. I just wished I'd have made an impression by succeeding in my attempt, rather than drawing in gazes as the person who attacked the entire class. Conflicted, I sigh out loud as I lower my torso onto the desk. What everybody else finds interesting, I find embarrassing, and yet at the same time, I'm relieved that nobody hates me, and I'm glad to have made such an impression. Only time's gonna tell if my vanity will overpower my pride. Oh, if it isn't the bad boy himself. Oh, hey there, nefarious one. I tilt my head upwards and raise an eyebrow as a familiar voice reaches my ear. What's with the odd nickname? They are not nicknames, fool. They are the titles you have now been branded with. I intended to use them in a slanderous manner, but I suppose one such as yourself might wear those titles with pride. One such as myself? What are you talking about? No, before that, why would you intend to slander me? What did I do to you? Leisha narrows her gaze and stares at me, clearly bemused. Not just me. It's what you did to the entire class. Oh. Common sense finally catches up with me. After being praised for my deeds yesterday and told that they were nothing to be ashamed of, I have begun to think that I was the only one who viewed them in the negative light. However, it seems that Leisha, the valedictorian of my grade, is of a similar opinion to my own. To be perfectly blunt, I'm disappointed in you, Sable. I had thought you to be a talented yet reserved individual who adhered to the rules and took pride in their work. But as it turns out, you're a little more than a show-off who doesn't know their own limits. Leisha's words sting, not because of the hostility in her voice or the notions that she's raised, but it's because I agree with her. Leisha, I know that I... Don't bother, I'm not the one to whom you must answer. Leisha cuts me off, but surprisingly, rather than portraying anger, her voice is serious and unwavering. There is no emotion in her voice. She recites the words as though reading from a script. You will pay for your actions as dictated by the proper authorities. Please leave immediately. You have been summoned to the principal's office. Oh no, we are in trouble. Following a map of the academy on my terminal, I make my way toward the principal's office. With my hands shaking and my face no doubt contorted in shame, I make a conscious decision to ascend to the level on which the fourth year classrooms reside. Not because it's quicker, but because there's almost no fourth year students, and of the few students who've made it that far, I'm not acquainted with a single one of them. Right now, I don't want to be seen, not by my classmates, not by my acquaintances, not by anyone. I just want to be alone. Unfortunately, I've been summoned to the principal's office, and I have no intention of digging myself into an even deeper hole by keeping him waiting. I must face the music. No matter how scared I am, I need to report in and answer for my actions. So, troubled though I may be, I slowly walk down the empty hallway alone. I breathe slowly and deeply, I calm my mind as much as I can. I tell myself all kinds of lies about what's about to happen, trying to assure myself that everything's going to be okay. And before I know it, I've arrived. Excuse me. I find the door to the principal's office already open. Peeking my head in, I glance around the room and call out weakly. Oh. Oh, there is someone here, hello. I didn't mean to intrude. Not at all. This room is always open to students in need. How can I help you today? Greeted with a smile, I nervously enter the room. Oh, I was told to come here by one of my classmates. My name is Sable, I'm in class 1C. My classmate Leisha told me to- Leisha? The man's face warps in surprise as I name my classmate. Oh, so she's making friends after all. Good, very good. Sir? The man stops laughing as he sees the confusion on my face. Oh, my apologies, child. When you called her Leisha, I assumed that you were close enough for her to tell you of our relationship before sending you over here. But alas, it would seem that particular honour belongs to me after all. My name is Ayn, or at least that's what you humans call me. I am the principal of this academy, and as her classmate, you may be interested in knowing that I am Leisha's father. Pleased to meet you, Sable. 
I stare wide-eyed at Iron as I process his words. Leisha's father is the principal. It explains her inflexible and uptight personality, does it not? Or so I'd like to see, but the truth is, I don't know where she gets that attitude of hers from. Oh, not that I'm complaining. Leisha's a good girl. She might not be adept at making friends. Please do not fault her for that. Oh, sure. Surprised by the principal's words, I smile wryly. Anyway, sir, about the reason why I was called here? Oh? Oh yeah, I suppose we do need to speak about that, don't we? Please close the door. There are some rather serious matters we must discuss. Uh-oh, still in trouble, though. Doing as the principal says, I close the door to his office, then present myself before him once more. In spite of his affable personality and warm green tin, Ina dots a rather serious expression as the reason for my summons comes to mind. Taking his time, Ayn slowly mulls over the matter at hand. After thinking in silence for a while, his eyes open wide as he spots me, as though he's only just remembered that I'm present. After coughing in embarrassment a couple of times, the principal fixes his gaze on my face and addresses me properly. Now then, what to do with you? To your credit, it's clear that you didn't mean any harm. And from what I hear, when the spell did go out of control, you took all of the damage onto yourself in order to spare your classmates. On the other hand, you deliberately dissipated your teacher, you allowed your pride to influence your actions, and as a result, you put your classmates in danger. Given the circumstances, please understand that I cannot simply let you off with a warning, even if you are a new student. I bow my head silently. I have already prepared myself for the worst case scenario, and I won't hold the principal's decision against him. Seeing this resignation on my face, the principal appears to comprehend my thoughts. So, you've made peace with the fact that expulsion is on the table, have you? True, it wouldn't be unheard of for a student to be expelled in this kind of situation. We tolerate a lot of this academy, seeing as how most students are teenagers yet to understand their own powers. But when it comes to the safety of the other students, we cannot afford such leniency. The principal walks over to the cabinet on the side of the room. He then pulls out an orange bangle, closes the cabinet and returns to my side. Here. Iron places the orange bangle around my left wrist. My arm starts to feel weak as soon as the bangle touches my skin. This weakness quickly spreads to the rest of my body, and it soon feels as though my energy has been sucked out. The ether stored within my body has been almost depleted. This bangle is a magical artifact made of fossilized tree resin from a mystical oak tree in my home village. It has the effect of... wow, hang on. You're telling me this is a magical artifact? I interrupt the principal as I gaze at the supposed magical artifact in surprise, somewhat sceptical of what he's just told me. This can't really be a magical artifact, can it? I mean, I figured that I might see one at some point during my stay at the academy, but I never even dreamed that I'd touch one on my second day here. Magical artifacts are ancient items which are said to possess great power. They can be wielded by anyone, whether they're a mage or not, and they require no known fuel or other stimulus. No human being alive knows how they're made, and there seems to be very few of them around, so they're always in high demand. Furthermore, they're often misidentified. In many cases, supposed magical artifacts turn out to be magic-imbued objects, or plain old magical tools. It's an easy mistake to make, but considering how rare and valuable magic artifacts are, it's a mistake which could cost the collector dearly. Magic-imbued objects appear naturally in ether-dense areas. Their powers are limited, and they become worthless when removed from their ideal environment. Magical tools are man-made items, they facilitate the casting of particular spells, yet they possess no power on their own. Compared to these common reproducible objects with limited usefulness, magical artifacts are infinitely more valuable. Needless to say, such a treasure would ordinarily be far beyond the reach of a mere student like me. Amazing, I've never seen one before. Oh, you'll be doing more than simply just looking at it, though I suspect you won't be too pleased by it. This is an artifact which absorbs ether at a phenomenal rate. Furthermore, once it's been placed on a person's wrist, it can only be removed by the one who put it there. Iron removes his hands from the bangle, causing it to fall limp on my wrist. The bangle immediately shrinks, making it difficult to remove through typical means. More worryingly, it then begins to float around my wrist, locking onto my ether signature. I've become its host, or rather, its victim. Your punishment for yesterday's mishap is to wear this bangle until I decide otherwise. Needless to say, Leisha, your teachers, and your other classmates will all be keeping an eye on you. It will be their testimonies that ultimately decide whether or not that bangle is removed. My excitement and enthusiasm from a moment ago disappear in a heartbeat as I look down at the amber bangle on my wrist. This might be the first magical artifact I've ever seen, but it doesn't mean this is a course of celebration. This is not a reward, it's a punishment, one I rightly deserve.
I'm sure I'm going to get used to the drain soon enough, but for now, I don't feel so hot. It's like all the strength is rapidly leaving my body. Forget about using spatial displacement magic, right now I can barely even clench my fist. Coming to terms with my situation a tad later than I should have, I cast my gaze toward the floor. That being said, if you decide you'd rather quit the academy than live here with that trinket on your wrist, I'd accept your resignation. No, I'm not going to quit. I'd accept the punishment. I raise my head and look iron in the eye. If this is the price I must pay for my actions, then so be it. I'm glad to hear that. This incident had me wondering what kind of person you were, but I suppose if you were able to become friends with Leisha, you must be an upstanding youth after all. I look forward to hearing good things about you from now on, Sable. Iron walks over to the closed door and begins to open it. Oh, one question, if I may. Yeah. Iron slowly turns around as I think about how to word my question. I know this might seem like a trivial concern, but considering what's at stake here, but um... If my ether is continually being stuck drier, how can I participate in practical lessons? I don't want my grades to plummet because of this. Oh, your grades? You're worried about your grades at a time like this? Oh dear, no wonder you get along with my daughter. The principal laughs out loud as I voice my concern. And I know it's hardly the most pressing issue here, and I really shouldn't be pushing my luck, given that my punishment is so tame, but even so, relax, your concern is completely reasonable and justified. Rest assured, your situation will be taken into consideration when you're graded. Oh, thanks, sir. I bow my head and silently move toward the door. Oh, and one more thing. Yes. I turn around to find the principal staring at me intently. I tell Leisha that her daddy loves her. That is the second part of your punishment. Oh, no. Yes, sir. Confused and dumbfounded, yet ultimately more relieved than I had been when I walked into the principal's office, I leave with more questions than I had when I entered. Back in class, after returning to my classroom, I failed to take notice of the lesson at hand. Instead, I spend the entire time trying to hide the bangle on my wrist, and wondering how my life will be impacted henceforth. As someone who takes pride in their ability to use advanced and obscure forms of magic, this bangle is quite possibly the second worst punishment I could have been given, topped only by expulsion. Though that might sound overly dramatic, I believe it to be the truth. After all, what use is a Magic Academy student who can barely use magic? I was already at a disadvantage to begin with, as one of the few humans attended the academy, but now I've been dragged straight down to the bottom. If I was in a higher grade or taken an advanced combat class, this bangle could literally be the death of me. From a student's third year onwards, participation in hunts becomes mandatory. Whether a student is a fighter or healer, or even a mere researcher, they are forced out into the field, thrown headfirst into life or death combat. The Academy does this for a variety of reasons, the most prominent of which being that it gives demi-human students the opportunity to show regular human beings that they are on the same side. It's also a good way to take care of dangerous creatures such as magic beasts or criminal demi-humans. In a sense, we're responsible for protecting human society from non-human threats. Of course, there are some who view hunts as barbaric or traitorous. Every year, there are students who refuse to hunt down their own kind, or to do the bidding of us humans. Unfortunately, what awaits those students is, without exception, expulsion. We are given no leeway when it comes to hunts, not on who we go with, not what we're hunting, or the conditions of the hunt itself. It's a lot for mere students to take in, Every year there are many who perish or wind up getting expelled, and yet year after year, the hunts continue. They're a necessary evil, as far as those putting our strings are concerned, but that's all there is to it. Perhaps I should leave the academy after my second year in Amadronia. I'm sure the bangle will be removed long before then, but even so, the thought of hunting down demi-humans doesn't sit right with me. I want to be a researcher, not a mercenary. If I truly crave death and destruction, I wouldn't spend so much time worrying about whether to share my research. To have my research weaponized, or to stand on the front lines myself. It seems that no matter which path I take, the militarization of magic is going to haunt me. Class ends, and I'm still deep in thought. In fact, I don't even realize that class is over until I see Eris leave the classroom and feel someone's hand on my shoulder. Mm, welcome back, delinquent. I trust that you had fun in the principal's office. Misha glares at me harshly. It's clear that she feels disdain toward me for my actions yesterday. Unfortunately, I can't take back what happened. I can't go back and make a different choice or change the outcome of my decision. All I can do now is apologise. I'm sorry. Even without your father telling me so, I know how badly I messed up. While I don't require any apology from the likes of you, I'm glad to hear that you've realised the error of your ways. 
and equally as important, it seems the principal has taken appropriate measures to ensure that such an incident does not occur once more. Oh, despite my efforts to conceal the amber bangle on my wrist, Alicia notices its presence immediately. Yeah, this is my punishment. Indeed, to think that my soft-hearted father is capable of such cruelty. A fitting punishment to be sure, as long as you wear the bangle, history will not repeat itself. That isn't my only punishment. I won't make that mistake again anyway. Um, it's not my only punishment, there is more. I agree, that's his fitting. But his other punishment, I'm not so sure about. Other punishment? Surely that bangle is punishment enough. What could he possibly expect from you on top of that? I look Leisha straight in the eye. With a serious tone of voice, I deliver the principal's message. Daddy loves you, Leisha. What? Daddy? Oh, I understand. Surprisingly unfazed, Leisha doesn't appear to be embarrassed in the slightest. To be honest, I'm disappointed. I thought that I would at least get to see Leisha blush. Perhaps I should have worded his message a little bit differently. Honestly, what an idiotic father I have. To actually use a student as a personal messenger and for such a pointless message. What kind of principal would abuse his authority like that? I smile and I shrug my shoulders. Isn't that a little harsh? I think it's great that the principal is willing to joke around with his students. Assuming that was your first time meeting my father, I suppose it's natural for you to think that way. But when you've known him for as long as I have, his attitude becomes quite tiresome. Leisha sighs once more, and then stares directly into my eyes. I apologise for my father's conduct. To actually order you to deliver that type of message right after giving you such a cruel punishment? Leisha's gaze lowers to my bangle on the wrist. Oh yeah, it did seem like he went from one extreme to the other. I do understand where he's coming from though. I mean, it's his job to be serious, but he also has to get along with the students. Him being able to talk happily to his daughter's classmate right after punishing them is just proof of his impartiality. As the principal, I think his attitude is admirable. Leisha stares at me in amazement for a moment. You admire my father? Even after he put the bangle on your wrist? Absolutely. Anyone who can calmly govern a prestigious academy filled with troublesome students, like me, is worthy of praise. I wouldn't say I'm happy to be forced to wear the bangle, but I certainly don't hold it against him. He was simply acting in the best interests of the students, and I don't blame him at all. I see. That's quite a refreshing outlook you have, Sable. Dare I think that my first impression of you was accurate after all. Dare away. I'll do my best to live up to your expectations of me. Careful what you wish for, Sable. I didn't become valedictorian by setting low standards. And now that you have that bangle on your wrist, you have a rather hard road ahead of you, should you wish to follow in my tracks. Well, there's more than one way to skin a dragon, you know. I may lack your sheer power, but I won't lose to anyone when it comes to my specialty. Mentally apologising to Dragon, I cross my arms and push out my chest confidently. Your specialty? No, wait, come to think of it, as impressive as I found that technique of yours yesterday, the raw output was rather lacking. Given your not-so-terrible rank, and the fact that you strained yourself to the point of losing consciousness, I would have expected something many leagues greater. For someone wielding your pitiful level of power to rank near the halfway mark of the grade, your performance in other areas must have been outstanding. Oh, don't praise me too much. My vanity has already gotten me into trouble, you know. I shake my wrist, causing the bangle to move around. However, Nisha appears to be paying my gesture no mind. Human, low output, impressive technique, needlessly proud. Is your specialty perhaps circus magic? That's what? My eyes open wide as Leisha utters something unthinkable. Circus magic? Are you kidding me? You think I'm studying here so I can be an entertainer? Am I wrong? Of course you're wrong. I'm a scholar, a researcher. What I lack in power, I make up for with originality and understanding. When it comes to sheer knowledge of magic, nobody in our grade has me beat, not even you. Oh, is that so? Leisha's gaze narrows. You think yourself more knowledgeable than I. A mere human who cannot even control their own spell would dare to compare themselves to a mighty elf? Act as haughty as you like. If it's a competition of magic knowledge, I'm confident I can take you on. Oh, you got a lot of nerve, human. Very well. If you truly believe your own hype, then I invite you to prove yourself. Prove myself? Wait a minute, you don't mean. I do indeed. After saying so much, surely you're not going to back out now. Sable, I hereby challenge you to a duel. Magic duels? One-on-one -on -one contests between two mages held in the hope of settling a dispute. Though they take on many forms, and the rules vary significantly, magic duels are typically divided into two categories, physical and mental. Physical duels involve having two magic users face off by using the techniques at their disposal in a practical manner. They use magic to compete directly, be it in combat, a race, weightlifting, 
or any other real-world application of their skills. Mental jewels, on the other hand, do not require any skill or strength. They are measures of wit and knowledge, and can be as straightforward as an ordinary exam. More often than not, however, mental jewels involve two mages simulating a fight or solving a kind of puzzle, armed only with their knowledge of magic. Mental jewels are far safer, and participants needn't be capable of using magic, but even then, the stakes are in no way inferior. When one mage challenges another to a duel, it's ready for fun. A duel on my second day at Amadronia. If I accept, what are the stakes? I wouldn't take anything meaningful from you. The only thing at stake here is your pride. Will you accept my challenge? Uh, I mean, I guess so. I'm game, as long as it isn't anything practical, of course. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I wouldn't be so cruel as to challenge a handicapped opponent to a fight. Our contest shall be one of the mind. We shall choose a mediator from among our classmates, and they will quiz us on the topic of their choosing. Do you find those conditions to be acceptable? I mean, sure, let's find a mediator. I walk around the room, trying to find someone who could help out. Most of our classmates have already left the room, and our teacher was the first to leave, so finding someone both suitable and willing proves difficult. Fortunately, there is one person I can count on. A battle of the minds between the diva of Class 1C and our grades valedictorian. Of course, I'd be honoured to mediate Hell's gonna help out. Perfect, thank you. Any objections? Nope, I'm ready to proceed, whenever you are. Same here, I guess that means it's time. Understood. In that case, we'll begin momentarily. This will be a simple test of basic general knowledge. There will be six questions, and in the event of a tie, there will be no tiebreaker. Basic general knowledge, you ask the two of us such rudimentary questions. This will turn into a mere contest of speed in no time. Please have some consideration for the one asking the questions. Loath though I may be to admit this, I'm arguably a one-trick pony. Even if you ask me for a more difficult subject matter, it's not as though I'm an expert myself. It's fine, general knowledge will do. This can be a battle to see who's the more quick-witted. That's okay with you, isn't it, Leisha? Okay, I suppose there is merit in such a contest. Very well, I'll play along. Okay, are you both ready? Leisha and I both immediately tense up and nod. Then, without further ado, when two or more mages simultaneously cast the same combination magic... Oh, you're correct, but please wait until I finish asking the question next time. He should narrow her eyes in displeasure, but otherwise makes no fuss. Just like that, it's one nil in Leisha's favour. Now then, next question. What is the name given to a recording of a mage's five senses, such that one might experience that mage's past for themselves? Wasn't that a... Oh, it's not a dreamscape. I'd, was it a sensphere? Or senscape? Hmm. I'm gonna go with a senscape. Correct, one point for Sable, one point for Leisha. Okay, it seems you have a fast tongue, if no other redeeming feature. Miss Valedictorian, please refrain from any sexual harassment until after the duel's over. Sexual what? No, I didn't mean it like that. You're the one with the filthy mind, not me. Leisha, he's just teasing you, I mean, I think. Either way, can we please get back to the duel? If you say so, question three. Amadronia Academy was founded on what premise? that all nationalities, species, and social classes are all equally entitled to and in need of proper guidance in the art of magic, should they display such an aptitude. Gotcha. That's no fair. Your father's the principal. You've probably heard that drivel since before you could walk. Be that as it may, you yourself should be all too familiar with the origins of the academy, given that. Oh, that's right. You were unconscious during that lesson yesterday, weren't you? Okay, right you are. My apologies, Sable. Okay, next question. Question four. Runic writing, the practice of drawing glyphs, is absolutely essential for the casting of spells, true or false? I mean... Yeah, it's true, isn't it? Oh dear, it would seem that our mediator saw fit to throw in a trick question. In most cases, runic writing is completely optional. However, there are some spells, typically very powerful spells, which do indeed require the aid of glyphs. Thus the answer is neither true nor false, your question is fundamentally flawed. Well, wow, calling it flawed's a bit harsh, but trick questions are perfectly valid. I smack myself in the forehead in my palm as Leisha answers correctly. While most people in my grade would be tricked by that question, and understandably so, I should know better. Heck, truth be told, I know a couple of those spells myself. I can't actually use them, but someday I might be able to. Okay, question five. As part of humanity's pledge to coexist peacefully with demi-human races, what was the first manner of law to be amended? Laws pertaining to the legal culling of non-human species. 
The deaths of demi-humans are now treated in a similar manner to those of humans. Correct. Leave it to an elf to answer that question so easily. Rather than curse Leisha's quick response time, I throw my brow at her reaction. While I don't know the finer details like Leisha, I'm well aware of the travesties demi-human races have suffered at the hands of mankind. Considering our checkered past, it amazes me that interspecies institutions such as Amadronia even exist, and yeah, our human main character is not helping that stereotype either. Anyway, final question. There are many demi-human races which are female only. These races must all mate with human beings in order to survive as species, true or false. Humans specifically? Not, not all, no. I'm surprised you knew that. Many humans think that the world revolves around their race alone, and that all of us demi-humans would die out without them. Indeed, while it's true for some races, it's by no means an universal truth. Humans need to learn their place. I get it, humans are conceited. Can we please just move along? Hell stands up straight and faces Leisha and I as she prepares to announce the result of the duel. Being a contest with so few questions, however, there's really no need. The result is obvious to all three of us. Despite my best efforts, Leisha has beaten me. The winner of the duel is, as one might expect from her rank, is Miss Valedictorian. For the proud elf, a round of applause. Hell begins to clap, and after a few moments, so do I. Leisha beat me fairly in a battle of wit and speed. I have no right to complain. There's no need for applause, rather, it will bring me great shame if I didn't win against a mere human. You put up a good fight, Sable, but this battle of wits was decided the moment you challenged the woman ranked number one in the grade. Pick your opponent more carefully next time. No, you pit me as your opponent, not the other way around. Well, whatever. At any rate, you sure showed me. I'll try to keep my pride in check from now on. And so you should. Oblivious to her own hypocrisy, Leisha puffs out her chest. Well, folks, it's been fun. But if none present have any objections, I'll take my leave. Alright, sorry about keeping you. Indeed, I thank you for acting as our mediator. Not at all. It isn't every day I get to witness a diva and a valedictorian go head to head. And on that note, I bid you adieu. Hal Bells takes her leave, hurrying out of the classroom with less composure than she displayed moments ago. Be it the need to eat or go to the bathroom or something else entirely, she's clearly been holding herself back. A diva? Don't ask. Anyway, now that that's behind us, what do you say we head to the cafeteria before the next class starts? My treat. Thanks for the offer, but I can pay for my own food. Being valedictorian does have its benefits after all with a hefty allowance being just one of many. You really do like bringing up your rank, don't you? Of course I do. Taking pride in oneself is only natural for those at the top. Mm-hmm, whatever. Just don't get too cocky. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, right? The bigger what are? To what or whom are you referring? No, never mind. Forget I said anything. Very well. More importantly, now that the duel's over, I have no further business with you. I will see you once our next lesson begins. Declining my invitation in a roundabout manner, Leisha raises one hand in a half-hearted wave as she turns around and leaves the classroom. Once she's left my side, I sit down at my desk and breathe a heavy sigh. Despite being the one who asked, truth be told, I don't want to go to the cafe. With this bangle shifting around my wrist, the last thing I want is to be around large groups of people. Until my nerves have settled a bit more, the best thing for me to do is to be alone and to enjoy some peace and quiet. Gotta keep our head down, I think. After enjoying a modicum of solitude, I am gradually reunited with my classmates. The classroom fills with students, all slowly trudging to their desks, until finally, as the last one to return, Eris shows up. Okay, kiddies, prick up your ears for a sec. Before we get started on the next lesson, you got a visitor? A visitor? I raise an eyebrow at the strange notion. Is it normal for entire classes to have visitors at the academy? Listen carefully, because chances are you brats are going to be seeing a lot of her. Everyone, meet the Academy's nurse, Mrs. Raphael. Oh, Eros, have I not told you? It's just Raphael. Should I one day marry? Only then may you call me Mrs. Eris's eyebrows twitch in response to Raphael's words. Oh, how careless of me. But it would seem that I'm not the only one who misspoke, don't you think? Okay, I cannot say I've heard anyone else misspeak since I arrived here. Perhaps your hearing is deteriorating in your old age, Eros. Aha. Uh -huh. Eris resists the urge to call with Raphael as the two exchange a minor war of words. Surprisingly, it seems like Eris has some kind of reservation toward Raphael. Either that, or she makes a conscious effort to act more kindly toward her co-workers than her students. Moving along. Good morning, students of Class 1C. I'm Raphael, and I preside over the infirmary of Amadronia Academy. 
Should we have the pleasure of meeting one-on-one, -on -one, it will likely be at the cost of your life. Uh, don't you mean the cost of our well-being? If that was what I meant, then that is what I would have said. Aha! Uh -huh. I, along with the rest of my classmates, am left speechless. Raphael might look like an angel, but her words are nothing short of scary. For today, I merely wish to introduce myself to you all. Many of you will soon come knocking on my door, after all, so I feel it's important that you prepare yourselves for our imminent reunion. Should you prove to be talented in spiritual magic, however, we may yet see one another outside of the eternal abyss. Though, looking around this classroom, I highly doubt that any of you meet that criteria. Wow. Leisha grimaces at Raphael's joyful yet harsh words. Leisha might be outstanding in most areas, but she is notably worse at spiritual magic than she is at other types. For someone so full of pride, hearing a teacher mock her lack of ability must be unbearable. Come to think of it, Ray is talented in spiritual magic, isn't she? Perhaps not on the same level as Raphael, but she still leagues ahead of Leisha and I. Cruel, though it may be for me to even say this, even Ray apparently has one redeeming subject. Well, I've said all I intended to. Should any of you develop an aptitude for spiritual magic, we may meet again once you reach your third year at the Academy. If not, then I look forward to guiding your soul as it departs from this wretched world. Wow, leaving the entire class dead silent, Raphael departs with a scary smile on her face. All of a sudden, I wish from the bottom of my heart that I never need to visit the infirmary ever again. I think it might be too late though. Okay, troublemaker. I warn you right now, kids, do not get involved with that woman. She might call herself an angel, but what she doesn't tell people is that she's actually the angel of death. See her one time too many, and you're never going to leave the infirmary ever again. Eris's demeanour is completely different than usual. Her voice is serious, as is her expression, thus giving us all a sense that her warning is not a joke. Eris truly does believe that Raphael is an angel of death. Anyway, now that the shitty angel's gone, let's get to work. The first up. Oh, Eris's face contorts as she realises which class we're about to take. Damn, maybe I should call that sketchy angel back after all. Turn on your terminals and jump to section C6. I thrust my arm forward and turn my wrist, causing my palm to face upward. Before I can invoke my terminal, however, something catches my eye, the bangle. Rather than invoke my own terminal, I decide to use the physical device on my desk, just like my classmates. I probably could still use it, even with this thing on my wrist, but the middle of class is no time to be experimenting. For now, I'll play it safe and follow the lead of my classmates. Operating the clunky machine, which proves to be much slower than my own terminal, I open section C6 of our grade's curriculum. After a slight delay, a series of digitised textbooks, research papers and other course materials appear in front of me. Then I begin to read through the titles of the documents. Let's see, The History of Man and Elf, Mandragoras, Plant or Animal, Assimilation of Silicon-Based Life Forms into Human Society. Oh, I know what that subject is. My lips naturally begin to curl up in a smile. As I look around the classroom, however, I realise that my classmates don't share my enthusiasm. Wow, well, seriously, we actually have to study this crap? I know, right? Demi-human social studies? Give me a break. Tell me about it. But if it's part of the curriculum, we have to study it. Well, you have to study it. I mean, I don't have to do a damn thing. Ignoring my teacher's irresponsible remark, I open one of the textbooks and begin to flip through. As one of the few humans in my grade, I seem to be the only person in my class who's actually interested in learning more about how demi-humans have integrated into human society. Most of what I know about the subject is probably out of date by now. After all, even now, it could be said that we're still in the early stages of learning to live with one another. The laws and guidelines surrounding demi-human integration into human society change year after year. It's interesting to see what's changed, but it's also difficult to keep up. Now then, everyone please read through the first... Oh, I don't know. Read whatever the first thing in that section is. There are no tests on this subject until the end of semester, so just start cramming a few days before, you'll be fine. With a wave of her hand, Eris leaves the classroom, effectively giving us all permission to slack off. Unlike the rest of my classmates, however, I keep the physical terminal in front of me turned on. Is this really such an easy subject that the entire class can slack off without worry? Even Leisha has turned off her terminal, as she's the top student in our grade. Maybe my time would be better spent doing something else after all. I mean, I think we've had enough trouble and we have missed some classes. I think we need to study up. So, sorry guys, we're not going to chat, we're going to study hard. Deciding not to follow in the footsteps of my classmates, I open one of the prescribed texts, namely, The History of Man and Elf. Okay, we're going to go into a lesson now, but I think we can continue this in the next episode. This is Usho signing off, and hopefully I'll see you next time.